is Clint Goyette. He owns and uh, operates a Valley Fishing Guides. Um, you've been in the game a long time, I know, and know the area probably as well or better than anyone. And, and really, I think you were one of the original guides out there. So uh, very excited to have you on here. And uh, I know it's an area that I'm always curious about as we we're just talking about. So I'm excited to, to dive into this with you. How's it going? Good, good, really good. Happy to be here. Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. It's always good to uh, sort of, you know, push outside of, of your home waters and, and see what else is out there. So uh, we're going to be talking about a fan one, uh, didn't read the title, uh, the Squamish area. So uh, Squamish, uh, just uh, what, maybe an hour and a half outside Vancouver. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, it's halfway between uh, Vancouver and Whistler, right in yeah. the middle, just before you start climbing. Super the highly hill. trafficked area. I know we have customers all the time who you know, they go on at Whistler for whatever reason. Uh, and they want to mix in some fishing or they're going to Vancouver on business or whoever it may be. And so um, your area, I think, is really special. And that's a, a really diverse area in terms of opportunities within great proximity of those places. So um, I think one that gets a lot of interest. Yeah, like landing in, in YVR, you're about an hour and a half to the water. So yeah, it's pretty Sweet. good. And it's almost a year round season too, right? Yep. Yeah, I, yeah, like I said, I don't I don't really fish much in December, January, and February, but you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So or on this as always, um, I'll let Clint kind of run the show and, and talk about um, you know, his stuff and what opportunities uh, await you out there. If anyone has questions though, we want this to be interactive and questions always make it more fun. So feel free to participate. We just ask that everyone stays on mute. If you want to ask a question, just use the chat function at the bottom of the screen and we'll address it as we go. Um, cool. With that, I guess I'll just throw it over to you, Clint. Where do you want to start? Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll just pull up the, um, the slideshow I prepared and sort of go over a little bit about Squamish and a little bit about me. So yeah. I'm going to just share my screen here if that works out. And uh, okay. you've got you've to let me, I think, do that. And uh, I've got a little slideshow right, to go over everything. Um, here we go. So let's do this one. And can you see what's going on? Yep. Uh, you had, uh, full screen that All right. Us there. here we go. Cool. So here, here's the, uh, here's me, my, my website. I'm Clint Goyette. I'm, uh, I've been in Squamish since 2004. I moved to the area in, in 1998, originally in Whistler. And then you can see in the photograph on the on the right, that's our Garibaldi Mountain um, in the background where we all fish for pink salmon in the in the summertime. And uh, so uh, a little bit about me. I've owned and operated Valley Fishing Guides since 2000, so going in 23 years. I'm originally from Deep River, Ontario, north of uh, about five hours north of where you're sitting right now, maybe six, and I uh, went to school at Dal and Sir Sanford Fleming for fish and wildlife and uh, ended up out here and picked up the fly rod and started the guide service. Uh, when I started the guide service, I wanted to differentiate myself from everybody else, so I began adding to my resume uh, the certified casting instructor through the what was the Federation of Fly Fishers, and now it's the Fly Fishers International. Uh, I take first aid courses and swift water rescue and all of those things to keep my clients safe. So uh, I've done that since the beginning as well. And uh, I did some Transport Canada Small Vessel Operations uh, Certificate, which basically allows me to be a coastal guide as well out in the ocean. Um, and then uh, I was actually the first professional angling guide certified by the uh, Canadian Human Resources Commission in all of Canada did the first first I got a pin and everything so okay. and uh, yeah and I'm a competitive angler and I've been doing that since 2005 and I've been across the world uh, three times and in Mont Tremblant 2016 as part of the national fly fishing team so let's talk about the fun places we go uh, Squamish is located at an uh, hour and a half north of Vancouver at the, uh, at the head of Howe Sound, where the Squamish River pours in. Uh, and there's five rivers, uh, really, that we fish in the area. Uh, the Squamish is the main river. 
Um, and then the first tributary as you go up from the ocean is the Mamquam, and then the Chequemus, um, which goes all the way up to Whistler. Um, and there's a, there's a facility, dam facility on that one. Uh, Ashloo Creek, which is also a tributary, comes in on river right, uh, further up the river. And then the Ilaho is the actually the largest larger river, but they named it the Squamish for for the local uh, First Nations. So here's a little map. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I'm going to sort of talk about where Squ here's Squamish and the small bit of Howe Sound. Can you see my pointer there? Yeah, we can see it. So that's a good guy. Okay, yeah. So Squamish is here. You're going to stay in somewhere in this area. And then you've got the Chequemish River that comes in all the way from Whistler. So there's there's a it comes out and down and all the way through here. <clears throat> so there's there's what we call the upper the upper river, which would be above this lake, uh, and then the middle river, which is about halfway through, and that comes out of the dam. There's a dam here, um, and that's really just a uh, small rainbow trout. Um, and then where we fish for most of our guiding and whatnot is from this section, which would be about 14 kilometers of river to the mouth of the Chequemus where it enters the Squamish. And so from that point down to here is what we call the lower Squamish River and the, uh, the Chequemus. As you go up, there's a lot of First Nations land that takes you up to about this area here, which is the, uh, where the gravel road starts <clears throat> uh, into the tree farm. And so this section here is not really fishable. It's mostly oxbows and pretty slow water, uh, also on First Nations land. And then you're gonna hit the Ashley River, which comes in from uh, what would be river right, uh, looking at on river left right now. Uh, so that's a small creek, smaller river. It does have an IPP on it um, that does affect flow a little bit, but not very much. Uh, and it's a very, uh, it's the smallest of all the, all the rivers. I missed the Mamquam, which is actually right here. It's the uh, it's the first tributary as you go upriver, and it goes all the way up and into the mountains here. And then finally, after you drive all the way up, there's a gravel road that'll take you all the way up the side to the confluence of the Squamish and the Elaho, which is uh, you know 40, 40 kilometers of gravel road. Um, and then you can go up the Elaho, <clears throat> and uh, if you feel like fishing up there, but I don't spend much time up in that area. Um, because most of the anadromous fishing is, is below that. Um, but there is some fishing to be had up there if you feel like going for a really, really, really long, bumpy dirt road drive. So that's the, uh, where we are in the, in the grand scheme of things. And, and we do fish pretty much that whole section um, sort of above the reserve here, which is called the, uh, the Upper Squamish when we refer to it. Uh, it's from, from where the gravel road starts here, just below the Ashloo and all the way up. So everything I talk about will be from there. Uh, what do we fish for? Here you go. So right, like I said, December to February in, in winter, um, there's always trout, bull trout, rainbows, and cutthroats available. Um, and then you get into spring and, and March, uh, uh, March through May, which we're heading into now, which is, is prime time as far as I'm concerned for, for spring fishing. You're going to catch bull trout, rainbows, cutthroat. And steelhead, if you're so lucky, and you can see some examples of those fish here, those some big rainbows and a cutthroat and, and uh, a pink salmon. So uh, summertime, uh, June to September. So June and July were pretty much knocked off the rivers because of freshet, um, which is the snow melt. And that'll start around May long weekend and carry on for about six to eight weeks, depending on how much snow is up high. And when it goes away, then we can get back onto the Chequemus and, and that big rainbow in the net with the red side that was caught at the end of, uh, and sort of middle to the end of July. So that was a, a low snowpack year. We were able to fish that year. Uh, then, then you got to going to head into the, um, fall and the fall is when it's prime time everywhere and in, in every fishing destination I've ever been. September's amazing. Um, so then you're into all the trout species, rainbows, bulls, and cutthroat. Uh, there's a few straggler pinks usually in the month of September. And then we get into coho around September 15th and fish for those throughout the fall uh, until November. 
And if we're so lucky, you can see chum salmon with the star beside it there. It's a, it's a species that's been closed for the past three years um, and probably won't be open uh, for a while. But when it does come back and we're allowed to fish for them, they're a lot of fun and they're super easy for people to catch. And they're pretty much the second largest of all Pacific salmon. So we do actually get Chinook salmon, but we're not allowed to fish for those either because they're under a, um, uh, species protection as well. So we get, we get quite a lot of, of um, choice. So lots to, lots to play with. And you get um, some sea run bull trout and cutthroats too, right? Yeah, the, the, basically that cutthroat that's in the photo, the thir third one on the, or the middle one on the right is a, is a cutthroat trout. That would be a, a, an adramus fish. Um, so right now they're entering the streams to spawn. They'll be in March. They're, they're in now. Um, and so they'll hang out. They'll, they'll come and go. They'll follow the salmon fry as they leave. The chum salmon fry are, are coming out of the gravel now. And they'll start migrating out through the March and April and into May. And the cutthroats are right there with them in the streams and and at the all the way out to the ocean uh, out to the sound so yeah if you're lucky and you, you catch them catch them they're quite um cutthroat are a species that kind of move around a lot so if you're so lucky to see the splashing and the slashing that they do um they'll let you know they're around so you can you can target them usually with fry patterns and floating or clear intermediate lines um which are super fun but you have to be there at the right time so You'll keep that uh, that set up in your in your back pocket when you're out there. Cool. Uh, yeah. So that's that's the the rundown of of when to be here uh, for for the different species. Um, and then we can talk about what what the heck we use to catch these fish. And uh, I use a lot of nymphing for sure um, because it's the most productive. Um, pretty much year round, uh, uh, unless you're targeting salmon specifically, in which case we're gonna switch to the, uh, the single-handed uh, rod. So for, for regular nymphing, uh, you can see these two guys here with the, with the bull trout. Uh, they've got two ESN four weights with them. That's my standard setup for clients. Um, so that, you know, all, all the bulls and, and rainbows and cutthroat are, are, are gonna, we're gonna use those setups mostly. Uh, and then for bulls, when the fry migration's on, you're going to use uh, seven weight um, with the fry patterns. So you can see those two fellows there with, well, the three guys with the one bull trout, those, they're using a seven weight um, swinging streamers for, for bull trout in April. Um, and then you've got dry fly, which is not done a lot around here because we really only seem to have it in the months of August and September. And you have to... Uh, you have to pick your day and, and the location and, uh, but, but, uh, you know, if you're going to do it, um, you can use a five weight, um, any Spanish, Spanish dry or regular, just elk or caddis dry fly fishing is, is good enough. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say come here for the dry fly fishing, but if you happen to have the opportunity in, in the summertime, you, you probably want to carry a dry with you. You can get them in the, in March as well. Uh, there's, there's a small hatch. Uh, and then uh, for most of our steelhead fishing, we're going to use spay rods, uh, usually a seven weight, um, a 13 foot, somewhere in that, in that range. Um, and then uh, T11 is the, 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 the weight of uh, line that I use most of the time. Anybody got cool. any questions? Nothing I'm seeing just yet. Okay. Um, I feel like I had one a second ago. Oh, yeah, I was just going to comment. It's one thing I didn't address, and I'm sure you wouldn't brag about it, but I feel like it's worth mentioning. You've got to be one of the best equipped guys that I know of anywhere in the world. I know like you set up all your clients with not just sage rods, but current brand new sage gear, new boats, new waders, the whole bit, right? Uh, yeah, I, I supply everything. Everything everything that everybody's wearing in those photos, except for one, is, is, is my stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, ESN rods, uh, X, X rods for singles and X and, and some other brand, uh, some other ones for, for spay rods, but yeah, I've got, I've got all the good stuff. Um, again, I use, I, you know, I trade them back and forth. You know, if I'm fishing it one day, I want to know that if that's the rod that I want the clients to use the next day. Right. So, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to use my own. Not that that's everything mm -hmm. I've got, but definitely, uh, 
yeah, pretty cool perk of fishing with you. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you get you get sims, you get all the all the good stuff. Um, it's pretty important, you know. The mother nature is the the hard thing to figure out, but at least I can provide the right gear to get, to get us there. Um, so so that's that's a definite. So and um, yeah, you mentioned nymphing stuff. So you're, you're mostly uh, Euro style nymphing on these fish, right? Yeah, exactly. I don't I don't use indicators myself. Some people do. Um, I don't. I get people on the Euro nymph uh, for most of the most of the fishing. Um, if we have to reach out far, usually I'll be switching it up to a streamer. Um, you know, it's easier to cover water that way. And, and, um, yeah, I just don't like the clunkiness of, of, uh, of the indicator fishing. Yeah, that's cool. And I feel like it is something that somebody might key in on, especially if they're coming out from our area. I know, you know, we do tons of good here. So if somebody was getting prepped and they were coming out thinking that they might do a bit of that, uh, three, four white, I assume, longer lengths kind of 10 six up to 11 kind of length uh, i use uh 10 foot four weights um okay. and i have a 3106 uh esn as well that i prefer to use in the winter time lets you okay. reach out a little bit further and it also yeah. acts more like a four weight so it's, it's my preferred rod but for clients i use a four weight 10 foot um just because i can up the uh the tippet size and and uh preferably not straighten some hooks but uh you definitely you use some heavier heavier uh Tippet, you know, I'll stay, I'll stick with 12.12 mil, uh, tippet most of the time for myself or 0.14 if I'm into the lots of bulls, um, or there could be the odd steel head around that I might run into inadvertently. Um, I don't fish 16 much unless, uh, unless I've got a absolute beginner that is going to pull probably too hard. Um, gotcha. Uh, and so that's the only reason I go up to that, that heavy. Cool. Yeah. Great. Context. Um, yeah. Um, so what do we use for flies? Pretty easy stuff. Nothing too crazy. Uh, stone flies, caddis, mayflies, worms. I didn't put any on there, but you know, everybody knows what a squirmy wormy is. So you can use those if you want. Um, egg flies, uh, fry patterns and, uh, and flesh. If you want to swing in the, in the dead and dying salmon time frame. Um, most of, most of my fish come on, on eggs or, or uh, pheasant tail nymphs and stuff like that. Coho, like the bright, shiny stuff, like the the goblin fly there that you can see that it's the green and orange beaded fly. We use those. Contrary to popular belief, coho take very small flies and not giant flies. So we fish pretty small stuff. That's a size 10 probably, maybe an eight. Um, most of our flies are in that size category, sort of 10 to 14. All of my jigs are tied on 14s. Um, and then the, the big black one there, that's, uh, pick your pocket. It's just, um, a fly that, uh, that works really well around here in different colors, uh, easy to cast, uh, on a spay rod. So I just, I generally just fish with stuff that's easy for people to play with, um, including myself. I don't like the struggle with the cast. So fishing a, a fly that I know works and it's better to cover the water. So I'll just take people through that way with, with stuff that works. So that's, that's what's in your fly box. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I assume for nymphs fishing, uh, pretty heavy on average. Uh, yeah. Four mil bead, uh, 3.8, uh, pretty much strictly a 3.8 built mil bead. Uh, very rarely in summer, I'll drop it down to three or 3.3, 3, but not very often. Most of the time you're, yeah. you again, get I feel like that's going to be kind of foreign for some of our audience where, yeah, three might yeah, be on the heavy side for some water, right? We'll, we'll get there, but the, the reality is we, we have a single fly rule in British Columbia. So you need all your weight on one fly to get down. You can't have multiple, unless you're going to use weight separate, uh, which I don't do. Um, so yeah, four mil will get you down in, and, and most of our fish are going to be in three to six feet of water. We remember we have, we have a lot of ways fish die here. And the big one is, is birds. So we have, you know, mergansers like crazy. We have eagles, osprey, all of that. So the fish are not going to be hanging out in anything shallow. Um, and if they are, it's usually because there's a billion salmon around and they're not concerned. Um, in which case, you know, you can, you, you just hold the, hold the fly higher. Uh, you still need to get down below though. So, I feel yeah. like another unique thing might be the, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, a lot of the fishing be done just with egg flies. 
where I think, you know, a lot of people here are pretty familiar with fishing those for salmon and steelhead, but maybe not so much resident trout and maybe not so much in the summertime, but it's more of a year round phenomenon out there, right? Yeah. So eggs, eggs are in our system. Yeah. Year round. I mean, there's coho spawning last week. Um, so, you know, they're still spitting out eggs and also anytime there's a big rain event, they get stirred up. So whatever's in the gravel gets, gets pushed around. Um, there's Alvin's around now. So they're going to key in on that orange color as well. Um, so yeah, eggs is, you know, they're just a standard, you know, it's like a worm, like there's always worms around. Right. So, so I think, I think you, you don't go out without a, without an egg pattern. Uh, right. You just got fish spawning like almost 365 with your summer salmon runs too. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The bulk of, I mean, it's really tough to fish eggs during the, the peak of the salmon return. Um, usually I'll try and go to a stream that has less, less salmon when it's, when it's in full, full steam. But if you, if you hit it the week before the, the bulk of this, you know, early August, early to mid August is okay. Um, and then waiting until, you know, October and November, um, to, to get past the, the bulk of the, the, the pink spawning. Um, but if you, in a non, in a non pink year, you know, even year, uh, the few Chinook salmon that spawn, there's some good opportunities there because they're dropping 10,000 eggs, not 1500. So there's, a, there's a lot of food getting dropped out of one fish and, and that can really, uh, really pull in the, in the bulls and the rainbows in behind them. So yeah, even though we can't fish for them, they're, they're a huge benefit for the, for the system. So for sure. Yeah. I meant to ask as well. I realized on that last slide talking about the different fisheries that, that you focus focus on and during that melt period um or maybe just before that sorry um but dur just during that kind of melt period uh where you know the squamish and some of those other tributaries be off the table just because they're all muddied up are there other fisheries available that people can fall back on if they happen to be in town um well i mean there's always the lakes up in whistler um and and generally you know the the dam that flows uh on the Chequemus. Um, the dam on the Chequemus, generally that river will stay somewhat clear uh, in certain areas. But if you if you got a really big rainstorm, generally the rivers only go out for two days or so. Um, oh, okay. and, then the, and then they come in on, on like the smaller the river, the faster it comes into shape. It's also the faster it goes out of shape. Um, so, you know, if you know which ones to, to run around and, and get to, that's why we, we're not really limited. You know, once the rivers come into shape after freshet, there's usually a place to go, um, even if you have to go up to Pemberton and fish, fish one of those rivers up there. Uh, it's a bit farther away, but you, you're going to have access to, to somewhere to fish. And like I said, the lakes are the lakes are still available. Nothing, nothing big in our lakes, but, uh, you know, you're you're definitely going to you're going to want to spend your time on the river. But you can fish the rivers at, at quite a, you know, you'd be surprised how, how dirty the river can be and still and still do well. I can show you some photos of that later. Sounds like a good reason to hire a guy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I said, there's five rivers to choose from. And if you pick the wrong one, uh, you could be wasting your time. Uh, so we did the, so yeah, things to consider. Here we go. So some of the reasons that we like to hire guides, you need to understand the regulations. And you can see that sign that I put up. I put 18 signs up during COVID throughout the Squamish Valley. So everywhere there's one of those signs, there's a spot to go fishing somewhere near it. Um, and they're, they're spaced out at about every kilometer or two. Um, gives you the regulations. Basically, it's very simple. It's no, no bait, uh, single barbless hooks, one fly. Um, uh, it's all catch and release. And uh, if you want to fish for steelhead, you have to have a steelhead tag, which is, I think, $60 for a non-resident. Um, and that's for a whole year. It's not for the day. It's for the whole year. So if you bought it April 1st, it's good till March 31st. That's our, our rollover for licensing is April 1st. So a basic license is all you need to go fishing, uh, in, and, uh, as long as you're following the regs, um, you'll be fine. Uh, in order to retain salmon, you need a, uh, what's called a salmon tag. Um, but that opens and closes with regards to what you're allowed to take, uh, according to DFO and generally you're, you're only going to be allowed to keep uh, in recent years, one hatchery coho per, per day. 
and that's from September 15th until December, basically, when they stop. A um, few other things to consider. We're in a remote area. You saw the map earlier. Uh, cell phones end in Squamish. You don't get it once you turn and, and, and leave the, uh, the main town. Uh, cell phones exist on the, on the Chequemus River, but not on the main stem Squamish as you go up to the upper, which almost all of these photos are from. Um, fresh it. Uh, if you're planning a trip to Squamish, don't bother coming river fishing in the month of June. It's a waste of time. Even the latter half of May is a dicey, a dicey time. So I would probably refrain from a trip between May long weekend and basically August long weekend. It's, it's pretty questionable. And then August is great. August, September. I mean, outside of the, have, you know, sweating in the, in your waders, August can be fun. Um, looks like we might have a chat question. Yeah. I think you're going to like it too. Okay. I'll see it there. I can read it. Uh, 511 turbo. <laughs> yeah. You can Google it. 511 turbo. Uh, that's that, um, the mayfly that I showed at the beginning, um, with there was on the cork and I'll go back to it. Um, you can, uh, I think the tying instructions are actually on my YouTube channel uh, on, on how to tie that fly. It's, it's probably the number one producer. And you'll see in my hand in one of those photos, there was a, a really dark brown mayfly. Um, lots of those around in our rivers. Uh, so, so definitely uh, highly recommended to be in your box. Probably puts 90% of my fish in the net. Um, you just got to fish it with, with authority. Um, hope that answered your question, Brian. Uh, so we're at fresh at here. Uh, so yeah, fresh it. Yeah. You got to avoid that. Um, and don't be afraid of the rain. It, it comes and goes. Um, I mean, the, you're going to have wind Squamish means mother of wind. So it's going to be windy. It's going to be a horrible, uh, casting day after about 1130 or 12 o'clock. Uh, the wind comes up in, in the spring or basically every, t every part of the day from about noon onward it definitely gets challenging. Um, and then just the rivers themselves are, are it's a, it's a wild place. We've got lots going on. Uh, rivers are very unstable. You can see my buddy sitting on a log there. That's, uh, that's just lying there on top of some very loose gravel, but you know, he, he decided that'd be a great spot to watch me fishing. So I, I spun around and took a picture. Um, the, the water there is probably about three feet below, deep below them. Um, so if you fell in there, it wouldn't be a fun day. And it's probably also, that's a November day. So the water is about three degrees Celsius. So water temperature is a big thing here. You know, we don't worry about getting, taking a dunk in the East. Um, in BC, it can be a day and or and a long walk home to the truck. We're probably about at that location where he's sitting, we're probably a good 15 minute walk to just getting there through the, through the forest. Um, lots of wood. So if you fall in, you got to be aware, you got to be aware of your wading skills and, and what you're doing. It, there's, there's a lot of sweepers and, and dangerous stuff out there. So you gotta be careful. Bears, uh, lots of bears, uh, grizzly bears, black bears, um, more so around salmon season. They're not much of a, a worry in the summer. Uh, as you get into September, October, November, then they're, they're definitely out there with you. So you got to keep your headphones out and your ears on. Um, and then conditions change quickly up in the upper Squamish. We have lots of tributaries that come off of the high peaks. So a hot day, the river can come up meters um, and, uh, and you wouldn't notice it until your campsite's underwater. So if you decided to camp up there, you're, you're, you stay well away from it. And you don't go over any major tributaries that there's usually signage that says, don't go here if, if there's a big rain or, or heat wave. Um, lots of people have been stuck on the other side of a, a washed out road with their car for nine or 10 days on the other side. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just be prepared for the unexpected. The, the bottom photo there with that white cloud, that's actually fire smoke. Um, I was fishing in the upper Squamish in 2020 uh, during the COVID timeframe when we could 
couldn't do much. We were allowed to go fishing. And uh, April 14th, that fire started and we couldn't get back to town um, almost. It was very close. So we almost got stuck on the other side of that fire. Uh, and it was pretty pretty good one. So yeah, lots to think about. Uh, I carry a cell phone uh, uh, all the time and I carry a sat phone and an in-reach up in the upper Squamish for communications uh, in that area because you just don't have any other ways to, to contact for help. So you gotta be aware of that. Uh, lots of cool stuff out there to keep contact. And uh, let's see, I think that's pretty much places to stay. Where that's the that's a Sunwolf cabin there. Um, little nice little cabins on the Chequemish River you can stay at. But there's also hotels, lots of lots of hotels in Squamish to choose from. Sandman, exit, um, you can read them there. Uh, I like the Sunwolf cabins, but they're pretty booked up for weekends. You might be able to get weekdays more than weekends, just because they use them for weddings and stuff. It's a pretty nice area. And then there's campground Paradise Valley, and then all the way up to Squamish, there's forestry rec sites that you can just sort of post up and, and camp at. Um, they're unmaintained, usually user maintained. Um, and they they if you go on the forestry rec site uh, website, you can you can find out what's open or closed. Cool. And that's pretty much the lowdown on what you're running into up here. I've got some contact info, but if you have any questions, fire away or I can go through some uh, some of my catch um, photos that I was showing you earlier, Chris. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'm never going to say no to that. But uh, when, when we get a couple going, we can uh, pull up some questions here too. I know that if anyone wants to see, um, is talking about it's great, but seeing is always better. If anyone wants to see stuff, I know you've done some really cool media production with seeing new fly fishers there. And I know that you've yep. done some other, I think, video. And certainly have lots of photos on your the website there for people to check out. Yeah, you can, uh, I don't know if I can. Oh, uh, video is probably. Uh, I'm just gonna copy that and then share it. We can try it. In my experience, uh, videos don't stream super well. But uh, let's just see here. Um, there we go. Let's see if this works. It's in the chat. Oh yeah, there you go. That's perfect. And fishing BC. A lot of footage in the fishing BC one of the area the different rivers that we've got yeah um so there's a, a couple of takeaways uh big streamers uh john um they can be useful uh, i i don't guide with them because they're hard to cast yeah exactly um you know i size eight woolly buggers nice and easy to cast and it catches just as many bull trout as any other fly um the toughest part about any of it is just locating them Right, it's figuring out where that where to begin. It's like I said, it's a huge river uh, system. the The rivers are productive because of salmon. So if you understand where the salmon have been, then you'll locate uh, resident fish easier. Uh, and that just takes experience and and understanding what's happened over the past six or eight months. Um, but yeah, I've tried tried some great big stuff. The biggest fly is that is that. Uh, black uh, intruder style that I use for steelhead and bull trout take that as well. And I, I prefer to use darker flies because it catches everything. Um, so I don't, I don't like to be too selective on that. So would you say that, you know, if there aren't salmon present in numbers in, in a river that generally it's not going to be quite as fertile or productive? Um, well, sorry, can you repeat that? Like, do you have some more isolated rivers that don't get the same numbers of salmon in them? And are the fish smaller as a result or just not? As yeah. Black? So the Chequemish River above the anadromous barrier, which is halfway to Whistler, mm -hmm. um, anywhere above that, they're, they're not going to be any larger than about 36 centimeters. Pretty small stuff. Yeah. Um, let me just read this uh, licensing. If you want to fish a few days solo, uh, you don't need a classified license anywhere here um it's just a regular license which is great you just need like i said if you need a special license for steelhead specifically uh brian um hope that makes sense yeah 
Fernie area is very special, lots of regulations there with regards to classified stuff. We don't have that anywhere near us. Um, streamers. Uh, I like to use single-handed rods for the smaller stuff. Um, but during steelhead season, if I've got a big piece of the Squamish that I want to fish, I'll, I'll go to a two-handed rod. Um, but nothing longer than about three inches uh, for streamers. That's, that's as big as you need to go. Um, a lot of guys are still fishing traditional, small, wet, um, sort of uh, classic spay, for, spay flies as well. They work great and easier to cast. Again, uh, for, for the guiding that I do, I, I get a lot of like, I've never really been fishing before, but I want to catch a steelhead. Um, so I, I'll, I'll get them on whatever's going to work for that, you know, day uh, and try and try and get them into stuff. Um, but single-handed rods for sure for coho, uh, pinks, um, and, and bull trout and, and rainbows. Uh, prefer, I prefer those because then you strip them. It's really hard to strip flies with spay rods and it just doesn't work very well is my experience anyway. Um, yeah, let me just see if I can get us to, uh, oh, there it is. The fun stuff, steely heads. Uh, I'm just gonna show you guys a few of the steel heads from our system. Those are lower fish. This is a river yeah. fish up Sorry. the river. Can you manage to uh, switch your screen share to that screen? Oh, let me switch. Yeah. Still on the PowerPoint. Up share. Let me go to uh, share screen. This guy. All right. Everybody see that one? That's a nice yeah. bright fly for a bright day. Uh, old, old photo, but one of the nicer fish and a nice run that doesn't exist anymore. So I don't mind showing you guys. <laughs> That's actually a dry channel. There's nothing there but weeds and trees now. Um, let me just minimize this thing there. And then we've got, uh, what, what else we got? That's, that's, that's a standard Squamish river run in the winter. This guy's still heading with me and he's on a single hander. Um, uh, but he got a fish. There you go. Nice day. That doesn't look, you know, un, uh, unapproachable for, uh, He's pretty excited. Yeah, around Terry Langley coming in. You know, that, that size of water. That looks yeah. very manageable, right? Yeah. So all these guys are fishing single handers. Uh, this is pre-2010 where I started guiding more with, with multiple as friends of mine that fish gear. So you can catch gear. Uh, single handed steelhead there too. Nice fly. Um, off he goes. Skip that. Oh, this is a. This is an April fish couple that never really did it before and managed to find one. I was on, a, I was actually on a, one of those um, goblin flies, the, the green oh, goblin. Yeah. We were fishing for bull trout and uh, that, that fish. So like I said, seal edits it's more about coming across them and they'll take whatever you throw uh, if you're so lucky. I've seen them take a lot of different fit flies. That's a good friend of mine into a, a nice fish that, uh, will come up and that's a, that was a random steelhead that we got in the fall. Um, mm -hmm. Not common to catch steelhead in the fall in the Squamish, almost never. This is one of the first ones. Anyways, uh, there's a nice steelhead from the Chequemus River um, in 2017. There's the fly, no magic to it, it's just to pick your pocket. So a nice, easy fly to catch. Um, and I, like I said, I stick to black flies mostly uh, just because they seem to work for all species. So I'm not gonna, it's more about covering water because there's, like I said, there's 200 fish in the whole system at the at the max and uh, it's a lot of water to walk by, so. Yeah, and you say that they're pretty grabby when you find them, so are you really work in a pool or you're just blasting through it trying to cover? You're cast and step, cast and step. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's about covering the water. If, if you feel like, uh, I mean, my experience is if you get a, a touch, you'll, you'll know it, and then you might go back through with something different. Otherwise, it's just pick up and go to the next spot. But 
when you, I don't know how to explain it, but sometimes you just feel like you need to go through again because it feels so good. So I will do that. Um, and, and we'll repeatedly fish certain runs because there's fish in them. Um, and they don't seem to move until there's another big event. So we'll, we'll go through. That's a guy in, uh, into a very nice big fish that we ended up losing, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's disappointment right there. <laughs> that's the one that we were caught literally three days later, same spot. Um, uh, it's, uh, somebody you might know actually. But uh, yeah, beauty, beauty steelhead. Um, so yeah, we get we get some nice fish in our in our uh, in our river for steelies. Uh, and they, like I said, they start now and they carry through. It's beautiful. You can still see all these fish. Yep. Some big ones too. Get some in the, you know, twenty pound class, for sure. All of these fish awesome. came on two-handed rods. This is the one day, probably one of the best days I've had. We hooked five that day, um, just a fluke beginning of April. Uh, just just hit them, hit three in one run and two in another. Um, and are you um, walking wading most of your rivers or? Yep, walking wading. Walk? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the reason for that is usually it's pretty cold. You can see this guy's soaked. You know, it's it's pretty miserable out there at that time of year. Um, you know, so we're going to jump in the truck and warm up and this might even have been that day. You know, we fished from whatever early morning, took a break, sat in the truck, the sun popped. We went out, took, took a few casts and found a fish and then got back in the truck and ended the day. It was too cold. Um, but, uh, yeah, stuff like that happens quite a bit. Yeah. Here's another cold day. It's freezing. It's, uh, these are all March, April fish probably April actually. Um, so let's go. And then, uh, so that's the steelhead fun stuff. Uh, let's see about coho's. Coho's uh, start in middle of September and carry through to November, mid-November probably. Uh, so good two months worth with the peak in October. Um, lots of Lots of fish in there. You can see the fly that we use the most, uh, green and orange. Sometimes it's copper or whatever bead. Um, that's the, the magic. And, and like I said, it's more about finding them. So we'll move around a lot. You can see the color of the water in this photo. Pretty, pretty dirty, right? But the fish show and you go chase them down. Um, it can be clear. It can be not so clear. Uh, like this, that's pretty brown. Uh, this is after a big flood. The, this is a big back channel, just pond basically. And we just came across it and it's full of fish rolling. It's around Remembrance Day. So you can see the poppy in my hat. Um, we were floating that day. So those are coho. Are you able to see those fish moving? Is that how you're finding them or? Exactly. Yeah. You just see them. They're, they're porpoising, they're flipping under the surface. Um, they're, they're really active and they like calm water. So it's like you're watching the flats for, for any sign of, of movement. And then once you see the movement, you just get out there and cast and retrieve. And the fun part about coho fishing is you're constantly trying a, um, a different retrieve. So you'll be, uh, you'll be, <laughs> sorry, that's my dog. Uh, there'll be a, uh, uh, you might use a roly poly. You might use a, a fast strip. You might, sometimes you might just cast and wait and watch your line tighten up, you know, as the fly sinks to the bottom, they'll take it. So there's lots of, lots of different things that you can do. Um, but you can have some pretty spectacular days. I think this guy here got like, I forget 20 that day. Um, it was, it was a pretty spectacular day, but a more realistic number is about five, you know, you get into five and a, in a session that's pretty good still that's a it's a blast especially coming from ontario where we have coho but not nearly that many right yeah, yeah so this is like classic way. coho water in the background there you can see the main rivers off to the to the right and uh it's just pondy you know and you'll see them flip this fish actually flipped behind this guy not so far back that's <laughs> from this year um 
so yeah, lots of, uh, lots of stuff to learn out there. And then we get into the bullies, which are my favorite for sure, because they're around everywhere and all year long. So you can always find one. Um, she's never done, she never fished before. That's her first bull trout. <laughs> Great fish to start on. Yeah. Yeah. You can see the flow in behind. So we're fishing all this calm, soft water as well as the, as the dump zones, classic, classic trouty water. Um, they're pretty lazy fish, so they're going to be in the slow stuff. And so they're around all year round. How's their behavior change cap throughout the year? Uh, mostly it's going to be what they're feeding on. Um, eggs or, or fry or, or pheasant tail nymphs or, you know, um, lots of different stuff. Uh, you know, this one I think took an egg pattern. That's a, that's a big fish out of one of the tributaries. That's Mamquam, I think. Um, and then this is all upper Squamish fish. He's from Czech Republic. He had a great day. Igor. Igor, yeah. Yeah. We uh we had fun, lots of lots of fish, but just beautiful fish, you know, uh powerful. Uh and they usually, you know, they're they're together with each other. So you're gonna find one, you're gonna find you're gonna find a couple usually. So it's it's pretty good. And uh yeah, so lots of lots of fun with the bull trouts. Catch them on everything, streamers, nymphs, eggs, you name it. As long as you find them, you can pull them in. Uh, Very cool. Yeah. Is there one river that you find holds bigger fish than others generally? No, they're they're highly migratory. So they're gonna follow the food. If you know, if one river seems to have more salmon move into it, they'll be right in there with them. Um they definitely like Chinook salmon more than pinks. So if there's okay. Chinooks around, you gotta find out where the heck they are. Um, but yeah, here's some standard bug photos that we have. These are winter stone flies. So when you see lots of those around, it's gonna be a good day. They may not be eaten, but the the usually it means the steelhead are active. Water's warm, uh, hydropsyche, and then stoneflies. Uh, there's the steelhead fly, and there's the five eleven turbo I was asked about um, earlier. Try a lot of them. That's why, because this fly is pretty big and juicy, and and they're. There's a lot of them out there. And then of course the eggs, right? <laughs> this this guy's been chewing on eggs all day long. And yeah, we figured it out. And uh yeah, I tie lots of them. Sweet. Eggs to see egg your favorite? Eggs to see is is the favorite. And there's there's some 511 turbos ready to go in the box. Oh, we got another chat here. Yeah, this is actually one I was hoping that we would uh, touch on. So I'm glad that you brought it up, Shelly. Yeah, do you fish the, uh, the Birkenhead much up toward Mike Pemberton? I, I fish the Birkenhead. Um, usually when the pinks are too many and I'm bored, I'll go up there and fish the uh, the Birkenhead um, because they don't get pinks. And so you can avoid the crowds and, and do some fun trouting uh, up there uh, in, in August and September. Um, so that's sort of when I spend spend a bit of time up there. And that's uh, rainbows and bull trout, right? Rainbows and bulls, yeah. Yeah, no they, do, they get sockeye in, in September. Um, they get Chinooks that move in, in in the springtime, and then they start spawning in, in July and August. So uh, egg patterns work up there as well as, as obviously the pheasant tail nymphs. And, and, and one good thing about the Birkenhead is it does have a lot of small rainbows, so uh, up to probably 18 inches. Um, but most of them are in the sort of, eight to 12 and uh, they readily take dry flies in that river. So you can, you can fish a lot of caddis up there. It's a lot of fun. Well, I've only fished it once, but as I recall, it's a really clear kind of classic Western looking river too, right? Like I remember being able to sight fish for some bull trout up there. Um, question, do I have a favorite bull trout fly in May? Uh, you're looking at it. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, it catches more fish throughout the year uh, than any other any other fly, because um, I think it, it represents a lot of different things depending on how long your wing is. It could be a small small uh, fish, um, but it definitely represents those those mayflies that are most numerous um, 
food in the river outside of eggs for sure. So that's what I would use in the first week of May. You might use uh, salmon fry patterns as well, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what I'd use. Nice. Uh, we got one more silly question. Yeah, and the water was in Whistler was white and milky. Yes, there are lots of fish in the glacier rivers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I also thought the same thing when I moved here. I thought, how could there be any fish in there? Um, yeah, there's there's lots of fish in Green Lake. It's pretty glacial and loads of fish in it. So yeah, um, and and our Chequemus River turns quite glacial, and the Pitt River is glacial, and yeah, they all, I mean, the Squamish is a glacier stream. And that's why there's bull trout. Bull trout require a, a glacial stream in order to survive. They spawn in, in glacier streams. So, yeah, lots yeah, of- That makes me think of even like looking more interior, like Kootenai River in toward Fernie is that same kind of thing, just like you know, whitish year round, but it has giant bull trout. Yeah, they, you gotta remember they're a predator. They're like a brown, you know, the browns, my experience is the big ones come out to play when it's a bit dirty. Uh, the river gets a bit dirty from a, a flood or, or whatever. And then on the next couple of days, when it's dropping back down and coming into color again, they're, they're lying in waiting for, for all the food sources that you don't see them. So, um, can you fish the Whistler tourist area and the river that runs through it? Uh, no, I, that's, uh, I think you're talking about Fitzsimmons Creek and no, we fish the mouth of it at the, where it pours into Green Lake. Um, and, uh, there'd be, there wouldn't be much up in that section at all. Just not, there's no food. No problem. Happy to, yeah. I focus on the mouth of Green Lake. The Green Lake fishery is the, all the tributaries just sit at the mouth of one and fish there. And that's mainly cutthroat or? Uh, well, Green Lake has bulls, uh, rainbows and cutthroat, but oh, you see bulls and rainbows, uh, kokanee as well. Cool. And how are you fishing those just pulling streamers and wets and stuff or? Uh, on, in Green Lake? Yeah. Uh, everything, has everything, you know, bugs and, and, you know, woolly buggers and all that stuff. It all works. Yeah. I fish smaller stuff in those rivers or lakes. Anything else? I hope everybody's copied down some of those links and contact info because you can book a trip when you're here. Watch throw up one more time just in case I missed it. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll go back to the switch switch the back to. Is there a period in fall that uh, you aren't taking bookings? Is there sorry a question? Uh, is their period in the fall when you're not taking bookings. I guess Shelly and I reached out to you last September and weren't able to get her in there. Uh, well, it just depends. I, I was sold out uh, for October in July last year. So yeah, when I'm, so there's just one of me. So when it's, when it's sold out, it's sold out, but I'm just gonna share this um, screen here. Share screen, I wanna share that one. And worth knowing, we didn't really talk about, but you do um, drift boat trips and heli trips too, right? Yeah. Um, I do heli trips in July and August for bull trout, mostly. Oops. Where am I going? Right there. Okay. Um, yeah, bull trout in, uh, in the summertime, July and August. Uh, it just, uh, it gets, uh, it's just weather dependent. Right. So um, the, if the river's in good shape, then it's worth doing. If otherwise we can do a lot of fishing here now with, without, and, and our bull trout population is doing pretty good. Um, so it doesn't always require the helicopter. The helicopter is nice to get away from people um, and, and have that opportunity at some, some pretty large fish. But yeah, there's lots here from basically August on. Oh, I'm going to pull up this chat. Um, Sorry, I opened another can of worms here. <laughs> back, back to, no, I can be booked all, well, I try not to fish on the weekends, <laughs> but I will if I have to. 
uh, or Thanksgiving weekend. Um, and last year I was traveling in September, so that was not possible. Um, heli fishing, yeah, July, August, when, when the fresh set's pretty much running out and, uh, and the bulls are migrating up to where they're gonna spawn, that's where we spend our time with, with heli stuff. Very cool. Yeah. Sweet. Well, if anyone wants to reach out to, to Clint, his contact's there. I'm sure, I'd love to hear from you. Um, <laughs> I've fished with Clint a bunch of times and against him in competition. He's good. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, but we send lots of customers out with, uh, with him and, and hear nothing about uh, but, but great things. So I'm sure you won't be disappointed if you happen to be out that way. Definitely reach out. Uh, otherwise, if anyone uh, needs to get set for a trip or, or needs some other general info, we're always happy to uh, help as we can at the shop as well. So thanks awesome. again, Clint, for, for joining right. us. Fun. Right. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me.